the grad student who discovered a way to control anybody's iPhone from anywhere in the world on this edition of Politicking. Welcome to Politicking. I'm Larry King. We've become all too familiar with the problems associated with hacking, both on a personal basis, if you've ever had your social media accounts or bank card hacked, and in the international sphere as governments increasingly rely on digital espionage, where covert spies in a shadowy world once reigned supreme. But a new fear has appeared in the digital landscape, weaponized spyware that can be sold across international boundaries to the highest bidder. What does that mean for the world? And can governments keep up with programmers determined to exploit this new arena of cyber warfare? warfare rather? Let's talk about it with Bill Marzak, senior research fellow at the Citizen Lab, which is part of the University of Toronto School of Global Affairs. He was the focus of a recent Vanity Fair article headlined, How a Grad Student Found Spyware That Could Control Anybody's iPhone From Anywhere in the World. He joins me here in studio. All right, tell me how you got into this whole thing. Well, um, so actually, I was pursuing my PhD in 2009 in a completely different field. I was working in databases, big data, cloud computing. Um, and then in 2011 and 12, the Arab Spring started. And I was in contact with some people back in the country of Bahrain, where I went to high school. And I was shocked to see the government you know, repressing the protests by killing protesters um, and cracking down very heavily. So I decided to figure out if there was something I could do to help. So I got involved, started uh, with some fellow activists in an organization called Bahrain Watch. A few months later, one of my colleagues started receiving some suspicious emails in her inbox. She forwarded them to me and said, hey, um, these look really suspicious. I think they might be designed uh, to infect my computer. How could every iPhone be vulnerable? Well, uh, every iPhone runs the same piece of software from Apple, iPhone's operating system. And, you know, as computer scientists, you, you might think that we're able to build secure or hack-proof software, but that's not a thing. The best minds in computer science can't figure out how to build secure software. So despite our best efforts, there's always these bugs or vulnerabilities or, you know, back doors into software that can be exploited. But how could the genius who invents the software not be able to help people prevent it hacking? Well, because modern software is so complex, there's, it's often not That's written right, by just one person. That's right, but you have it complex yeah. to invent, so it's right. just as complex to stop. Right. Well, it's even more complex, because even if I invent a piece of software, it grows over time. So more and more people start contributing and adding code, and as the original author, I might not know exactly what all the features are if people keep adding things. How did you find spyware? How did you get into it? Well, um, you know, so I originally started because um, I had no, no experience in computer security or spyware. But when uh, my colleague at Bahrain Watch got targeted with these, these weird-looking emails back in 2012, I started trying to analyze them and see if they were part of some spyware attack. Um, and that's kind of how I got my expertise. I got in touch with this organization, the Citizen Lab, and other people there trained me and taught me what I know. All right, when the, forgive me as a neophyte. When they hack, where do they get it? Where do they see it? Well, that's a great question. Usually, if we're talking about a government, there'll be some agency, maybe like an intelligence agency or a law enforcement agency, and they'll actually have a monitoring room that has TVs, you know, computers. Um, and from the monitoring room, they can target people's phones, and then, you know, they see it. You know, they're sitting there in their, their swivelly chair. They're looking up at the array of monitors, and they can kind of see what's going on in your phone and pull information out and look at, look at text messages and turn on your microphone and webcam and, and crazy things, you know. Um, it's really frightening. Did you contact Apple? Yeah, so quick, uh, right, right after you know, we had discovered this, uh, we got in touch with the, the people at Apple and disclosed it to them and gave them a chance to patch it. And what, now, I understand Apple issued a patch to fix zero day. What is zero day? So a zero day in computer science is a term for uh, one of these bugs or exploits or backdoors in software that nobody knows about yet, except maybe the person who discovered it. Um, so zero day means that the vendor, in this case Apple, has had zero days to issue a patch or a fix or an update that, that closes the vulnerability. Can an ordinary citizen protect him or herself from hacking? Yeah, so there's a, there's a couple steps that you can take. 
Um, so if you have a smartphone, you know, if you receive messages or emails on that phone, um, be careful about clicking on suspicious looking links or attachments that you get on your phone. Like if someone sends you a link to a website, or they send you a file on your phone, it's possible that the link or the file could contain uh, some sort of exploit or spyware designed to infect your phone. So double check to make sure you trust the person that's sending you the thing. Um, and you know, just, just be wary of things that sound too good to be true. Great pleasure meeting you, and good luck in whatever you do. Don't hack. <laughs> Thanks so much, Larry. Thank you, Bill. And Vanity Fair. To continue the discussion from the earlier segments of all things hacking, and what, if anything, can be done to combat this new front in cyber warfare, we turn to John McAfee, pioneer in the cybersecurity industry, CEO of MGT Capital Investments, political activist. He sought the Libertarian Party's presidential nomination in 2016. He joins me from Oakland. Heard all the headlines about hacks, the Democratic National Committee being hacked, John Podesta being hacked, Russia's alleged efforts to influence the election. What, what's your take on all of this? Well, I, I, there's, there's so much information out there, Larry, that I, I, to, I think to start with, we need to define what cybersecurity is. I mean, there's there's the, protect, the protection of our privacy, which we have none, by the way. There's a protection of our data, our critical data. We have none of that. Um, there's the protection against cyber attacks, like uh, denial of service attacks against uh, internet organizations where we can no longer get access to the internet uh, or a company's computer goes down. And then far more importantly, we have cyber warfare. Uh, the only front that we are, uh, America has any capability in is in cyber warfare. Uh, that began back in 2011 with Stuxnet, uh, a virus written jointly by the U.S. and Israel that destroyed half of Iran's of centrifuges to create uh, purified uranium. So the thing that distresses me more than anything else is that our government defines cybersecurity by and large, especially the FBI, the Department of Justice, uh, as using cyber technology to make sure that American citizens toe the line, that there are no terrorist activities, and the, that we are all monitored of and controlled. And this is what scares me, because that really is not cybersecurity. The thing about Donald Trump's cybersecurity platform that frightens me the most is that he wants the Department of Justice to head a national task force of law enforcement agencies to create our, quote, cybersecurity policies. Well, the, the agency that's going to head that up, we know, is going to be the FBI. They are the lead technologists within the Department of Justice. And, and look at what happened to the FBI. In 2013, they were shut down by Anonymous. In 2015, the Chinese stole every record that the FBI had. And in February of, t of this year, a 15-year-old boy hacked the FBI and published 30,000 records, including undercover agents of every agent within the FBI organization, almost 80 percent of their employees. And is this the agency that you want running America's cybersecurity? Well, what, there must be another. I'm, I'm sorry, sir. Go ahead. And what is John McAfee's idea? Well, my idea is, is let's address the real cybersecurity problem. Uh, for example, what the FBI has, what uh, the NSA has, what every covert agency within the U.S. government has is software and hardware capable of listening in on every conversation between every American citizen, reading every text message, reading every email, knowing who our contacts are, knowing everything about us. And these are being used against us now. Why don't we take all of that effort and realize that the American government itself has no security. The Chinese walked off with 23 million records from the Office of Personnel Management last year, as easy as could be. And yet, that office was protected by the state-of-the-art cyber protection technology. Do you, we don't have any. You think, Russia we have a, the, you think Russia attacked the Democratic Party? Do you think uh, the DNC and Podesta, they were uh, Julian Assange had anything to do with this? What's your, your view of that? 
Okay, well, here's the truth is, Larry, when, when the FBI or when any other agency says the Russians did it, or the Chinese did something, or the Iranians did something, that's a fallacy. Any hacker capable of breaking into something is ex extraordinarily capable of hiding their tracks. If I was the Chinese and I wanted to make it look like the Russians did it, I would use Russian language within the code. I would use Russian techniques of breaking into organizations. So there simply is no way to assign of, uh, uh, a source for any attack. This is a fallacy. This is what the FBI and other agencies want us to believe so that they can manipulate our opinions. But I can promise you, if it looks like the Russians did it, then I can guarantee you it was not the Russians. What do you think of WikiLeaks? You know, I believe that, that we should know, as American citizens, the truth of what is happening within our government, Larry. Uh, you know, our government wants to say, well, we have secrets that we must protect. Uh, there are no secrets anymore. If the U.S. government believes that the Russians, the Chinese, the Iranians do not already have all of our secrets because of their hacking technologies, then our government is deluding itself. So WikiLeaks, you know, it, it's, it's, a it's a tricky question, but I would rather know. I would rather know that my government is doing something illegal, like having the NSA spy on me and you and others, than not to know. Surely this, this is the only sane way to look at this. What's the purpose uh, the old comic strip Pogo used to say, we have found the enemy and it is us? <laughs> why, why would the government want to hack John McAfee's computer? Why? What possible well, John reason? John what, Why? Well, for, if, if, if it's me, then it's for any number of reasons. I'm the most outspoken critic of the FBI. So what? Of the NSA. In America, you can criticize them. They hack you to find oh, out that, what? That's to find out who I'm talking to, who my friends are. Am I involved in some subversive organization? Uh, am I doing something anti-American or undemocratic? Am I doing something that might in some way harm the administration or divulge a secret which I may possess? Um, but, but I have the right to privacy. It's in the Constitution. And, and yet I have no privacy, and neither do you, Larry. If, if you think that, that just because you are not of uh, a political activist or you're not speaking out against a government agency that they may not be looking into your life. I know that they are. Why? You are an important person. <laughs> you, you influence millions of Americans. So of course they want to know what you're thinking, what you're doing, who your friends are, and what you're saying. And I'm not being paranoid. This is just the facts of life as they exist today, Larry. We'll be right back with more politicking. Recently, Obama said that the United States are going to respond to Russian cyber attacks. Tell me what the United States can do. Whether well, it's Russia, China, or, or Iran, what can we do? Here is the problem. In terms of cyber attack, in terms of cyber warfare, we could destroy every country on the planet by, number one, taking out their power supply permanently. That's trivial. The unfortunate thing is, it is so easy to do and so cheap to create weaponized software, so can every other country in the world. 
There's not a single country that could not bring us down if they so choose. Why hasn't it happened? We're in the same sort of detente that we were in in the 50s and 60s, where nobody can push a button because they fear the response that might occur. We have weapons of software, weaponized software coming out the kazoo, but we have no protection. We have no security. There is no way to stop attacks from others. If we had any, then we would not have had the attacks against the Office of Personnel Management. The FBI could not have been hacked by a 15-year-old boy. We all need to get real here. How? Our country, like, I'm sorry. No, go, go ahead. ahead. Finish what you were going to say. Well, well it, it's, it's simply that it is so easy to create the weapons, weaponized software to destroy, harm, and, and, and uh, create chaos within other countries that we have totally forgotten the protection of ourselves. And had not the FBI and the NSA applied all of their talents into watching me and you and all of your viewers, we would actually have some cyber protection. But all of that effort has been, spa been placed on a country that is afraid of its own citizens. Who approves afraid that? Of people Who signs I'm off sorry? on that? Who signs off on their spying on us rather than on the other guy, the bad guy? Well, who, I, I who, have who, no idea. who yeah. edicts that? Well, uh, allegedly, it, it would come through the executive branch. But apparently, the NSA, on its own, took on the, the task of spying on Americans rather than its, its uh, assigned task of spying on foreign countries without any oversight. I mean, we are out of control here in cybersecurity. We need people who truly understand the full breadth of this. It is a complex problem involving not just our privacy and our security as individuals or as companies, but as a nation. The existence, the very existence of our culture, of America, depends on a change. And it, it can happen without new people, without new blood, without new talent. Nixon did this without the Internet. He tried, he invaded psychiatrist's office. He tried Watergate, right? Now, right. Imagine, imagine, let's say, an evil president. Now, you don't think Obama cares about going into your cyberspace. Do you, do you care? Do you think he does? I don't think so. No, obviously he doesn't, else it would not be happening. So you, you think he does know about it or doesn't know about it? Well, whether he does or doesn't, he doesn't seem to care. Clearly, someone doesn't care. I am smart enough. I've been in this business my whole life, Larry. And I'm smart enough to know when I buy a new telephone, within three days, some agency of the government has invaded my privacy by placing spyware on my phone, listening to me, watching me, reading my emails and text messages. I've long since given up on trying to prevent that. Instead, I use older technology for communications that matter to me, flip phones that they can't be, that can't be hacked. That's what I have. But, but this, this, well, good man, and stay with it, because, because I, I know when it's happening to me. Good heavens, I'm 71, and I've been in this business for 50 years. So I know that it's happening, right. Right. and not this, just to me. And I, can the same brilliance of technology counteract it? Yes, absolutely. But we have to have someone at the top or someone in authority that will say, look, the FBI, your job is not to spy on American citizens randomly, at will, by getting uh, sign-offs by some, some judge that you wake up at 2 o'clock in the morning who doesn't seem to care to give you a warrant that will allow you using a device called a Stingray, created by Harris Corporation, that will read and listen to everybody's conversation within a half-mile radius, even though you have a warrant for just one person. Please, this is actually happening. It has to stop. And we have to apply ourselves to, to the task of securing our country, our corporations, and ourselves from attack from any number of quarters. And we don't need one more attacker, that attacker being our own government. It's bad enough as it is. You were the developer of the first commercial antivirus program. Has this made you a target of hackers? Well, of course, yeah. Um, it's, a, it's a badge of honor, I think, for a hacker to, to hack me. And, and it happens frequently. Um, 
what, what happens is when people plant software on my, on my phone, I immediately identify it. Instead of getting rid of it, I try to find out who put it there. And then I keep my phone in a safe place when I want to have a private conversation. I don't have a private conversation with my telephone in my pocket unless my thumb is over the microphone. Uh, I, I don't let it watch what I'm doing. I keep it in closed spaces. So well, I can allow this. You're, you're painting this picture, John, that that instrument, that iPhone that you have on you is an enemy of you. Of course it is. It's, a sp it's the ultimate spy device, Larry, and it was designed to be that. Now, let me tell you why. The, the iPhone and, and Google's Android phones are designed for one purpose, to allow marketers and salesmen to have access to where you are, who your friends are, what you are buying, what color shoes you like, what color sweaters you're looking for for Christmas, so that they can market those things to you. Now, because it is, it is designed to allow that, then it is also designed to allow hackers to get in and do the same thing. I mean, I don't care if you want to sell me a pair of shoes because I can choose not to buy them. But when a hacker gets in to steal my identity or to listen in on a private conversations, well, that's a different thing, Larry, and that's what that's being used for. And the government uses these same facilities to spy on you, everyone who's watching you, me in particular, or anybody who looks like they are standing out of line or saying or doing something which might potentially uh, be a threat to America. How do you know that the United States government isn't looking into what Iran is saying, what Russia is saying, what China is saying? Why can't we do the same? Well, I'm sure we are. Which so, is what I'm saying. There are no, se there are no secrets, Larry. Not, not only are we watching the Chinese, the Chinese are watching us. We're watching the Russians. The Russians are watching us. They're watching the Iranians who are watching us. So is that there mutually... There are no secrets. So is that mutually assured destruction? It is if we don't <laughs> stop it. If we don't, if we don't develop techniques to prevent this from happening. Everything has been, has been focused on warfare. I have software that can attack you or violate you or find your information. But nothing has been placed on preventing that from happening from, happening from the other side. It's like we have nuclear bombs, but no bomb shelters. This is where we are today. So where does it all end? What's your biggest fear? My biggest fear is that, that Donald Trump will not see the reality of our cyber situation and will allow the current madness to continue only in worse form. His cybersecurity platform stating he wants the Department of Justice to control a nationwide task force is the most frightening, because we know that the D, the, the, it will be the FBI within the DOJ. They've been, they've been hacked more than anybody. What Please. would, the, what would they, the, if the, if the head of the FBI were with us right now, what would he answer to what you've just said? Well, you know, okay, so I debated on CNN uh, the FBI mouthpiece for 15 minutes, a very slick gentleman who started off saying it's all about security versus privacy. You must give up some privacy to get security. This is when they wanted to open the iPhone. And I was saying, no, nonsense, you know how to do it. And ultimately they did it on their own, only after so many people spoke out against them. My greatest fear is that, that, that Mr. Trump is going to overlook that subtle difference between cybersecurity and the use of cyber technology to assure our national security by spying on us. The trouble could That's be my the biggest fear, Larry. Trouble could be the public, John. Hitler in 1937 suspended warrants. He did away with warrants. And he explained to the German public, we have enemies within. If you have nothing yes. to fear, why do you care if the police come to your house to search it? And the public bought that. Do you think well, the American here's, here's public there. would buy that? Well, only if they haven't understood what privacy is, Larry. Because you, th you, you think if you've got nothing to hide, you have nothing to fear. All of us, a hundred times a day, exercise uh, a privacy function. When you buy something from the grocery store, do you tell the clerk the intimate details of your life? No, that's madness. For your casual acquaintances, you may divulge more. For a close friend, you might divulge even more. 
for your spouse, you might divulge everything, providing you're not having sex with her sister. But even then, you might not choose to divulge that. We all have levels of privacy that allow our society to function smoothly. And so if you say, well, you have nothing to hide, you've got nothing to fear, that means that ultimately everybody will know everything about everybody else. And we will have riots in the streets. Privacy is the glue that allows the negative aspects of humanity to meld with our positive aspects and have a smoothly functioning society. We are all, Larry, greedy as well as loving. We feel hate as, as well as generosity. We have grace but we also have fear and jealousy. These are the things that, that we must keep private from some people. Otherwise, your neighbor, if you're a Christian and you don't know your neighbor's a Muslim or vice versa, and all of this comes out, suddenly the person that you like to no longer like. Hmm. Suddenly there's animosity, secrecy. John, we all have secrets. We all John, must keep them. John, you're a great guest. Thanks so much for joining us. You're welcome. Always good seeing you. John McAfee, whoa. Thank you for joining me on this edition of Politicking. Remember, you can join the conversation on my Facebook page. Check out the Politicking blog on our homepage or tweet me at King's Things. And don't forget to use the Politicking hashtag. And that's all for this edition of Politicking.